Hello? There we go. Good morning, everyone. We're in the book of Titus again. We are finishing up chapter 2. It's been a while since we've been in Titus. Um, I was going to ask Rodney if I could preach a couple weeks ago, and then it was Easter, and I'm like, well, I don't know if I should do a Titus sermon on Easter. And then uh, uh, I found out that my parents were visiting, so I'm like, why not see if you'll let me preach when my parents are here so they can make fun of me. So um, we'll see how it goes. I'm going to try something different. Um, I'm going to try to preach with minimal notes. I got a tiny card. Normally I have three to four pages, sometimes five pages. But I got them here just in case. So if you see me coming back to my iPad to get back on track, that is, um, I'm defaulting to, to that. Maybe you'll need a little bit more experience before I go noteless. Um, but I'm really excited about this sermon um, there's a lot of things that I want to talk about that I think I've mentioned before in other Bible studies and uh, men's breakfasts and youth um, teachings. There are a lot of things that have bounced around in my head that I think about or I've heard sermons about that tie into this portion of Titus because it's ultimately all about the gospel. Um, it's all about God's grace, as you can see the sermon title. And that's such a vast subject in the Bible that it really ties into almost every aspect of the Scriptures. So I'm excited. Um, I might get a little emotional because uh, the grace of God is just that good. Um, it is something that we don't deserve, that He freely gives to us, uh, that is a wonderful gift that we receive. I'll start out with prayer and then we'll do a short review of what happened previously in chapter 2, because we're just going to take Titus chapter 2, 11 to 15, to the end of the chapter. And so I'll give a slight review of what happened in the first section, and then I'll have some questions similar to what Rodney does. But let's go to the Lord in prayer first. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time that you have given me this opportunity to share your word, to talk about your grace a grace that none of us deserve, that none of us can earn, that no human being deserves to be in. Lord, we know that there is a common grace that you give to all of humanity because we all deserve judgment immediately because we are sons of Adam, sons and daughters of Adam. We are all born sinners. We continue to sin daily. None of us are righteous, no, not one, but you show us grace, you show us love, and it's ultimately a view of you. It's ultimately your goodness that is shown through that grace, nothing that we have done. Lord, I pray that you would give me the words to preach, that I would be sound and clear-minded, that you would keep us on track to deliver poignant questions and, and points that you would have us find from your word here in Titus, from your disciple Paul. Lord, I pray that it would be clear that we would each be brokenhearted, either for the first time over the gospel, being transformed and saved. For those of, that are here that do not have a personal relationship with you, I pray that now would be the day, that now is the day of salvation. But I also pray for us that have been Christians for most of our lives or for long periods of time, that we would once again be emotionally affected by the depravity of our sin and the depravity of mankind and the goodness of God, the mercy and grace that none of us deserve, but that you show to us because you are so good, you are so gracious, and show us aspects of your love pour it out upon a people that do not deserve it. Lord, we thank you for your word that it gives us a glimpse of who you are, that we won't be able to fully understand God, but we can read your words and we can get just a, a tiny glimpse of who you are like Moses looking at you as you walked by, seeing the back of your holiness. We can see that through the pages, just a glimpse of our amazing creator, how loving and how merciful through your holy scriptures, but we also see it through our lives. 
through you blessing us in ways that we don't deserve, giving us opportunities that we don't deserve, putting loving people in our lives that we don't deserve, and ultimately giving us Christ and salvation that none of us deserve, none of us can earn. Lord, we are so just in awe of your grace and in awe of your love. And I pray that each one of us would be not just intellectually stimulated by this sermon, but emotionally affected, recognizing that even if our faith has grown cold, that you want us to be on fire for you, that you want us to have a, a almost guttural reaction to the gospel every time we hear it, even if it's the thousandth time that we've heard that we still want to weep at the thought of our wonderful Savior and God dying for our sins when we did not deserve it. Lord, we thank you for your scriptures. We thank you for the truth of the gospel. And I pray that you give me the strength to preach it with boldness and with clarity and with love and with honesty and use this broken vessel for your glory. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, we're going to read the whole section of Titus chapter 2. We're going to read 11 through 15, and then I'll do a slight review and a few questions. Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 11, says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying, un teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. So just a little bit of a review and a reminder, the book of Titus is written to a man named Titus, a younger man than Paul. He's actually lumped in with the younger men uh, that he should be an example in, in chapter 2, as we're about to talk about. And he is sent to the island of Crete, which as we've already read, are filled with, as we look back in chapter 1, verse 12, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And then verse 13 of chapter 1, This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. All right, we'll pause there because we don't need to go through all of chapter 1, but that's the kind of people that Titus is ministering to and is being called by Paul and ultimately by the Lord to build churches in this, uh, on this island, in this community of people that are known as being liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. That's the quality of people that live on this island. So in that group of people, he's supposed to find quality elders, people that are serving the Lord, and we went through the qualifications of that. So this is an instructional letter that Paul sends to Titus. We talked about how it's a, a form of discipleship, how Paul is trying to get Titus to know what his mission there is. And then in chapter 2, we looked at, I called it a, a spiritual checkup. We saw how young men, older men, young women, and young women and servants should act. So everybody is lumped in there, uh, and each have their specific things that are expected of them in the church, that Titus is supposed to make sure that these qualities are in these congregations among this very wicked city and island. Uh, he needs to find people and grow people and let people become more Christ-like through uh, obedience into God's Word here in chapter 2. And that's where we get into the end of chapter 2, 
The title here, there's a a small heading that says, Trained by Saving Grace. The end of chapter 2 is basically the reason why they should be doing these things and why they should care, why the older men should care to disciple the younger men, why the younger men should be reverent and respectful and have good character and integrity, why the younger women should love their husbands and love their children and love God, why all of this stuff matters comes at the end of the chapter. The reason why you should be doing these things is not just because Paul tells you to, not just because Titus tells you to, but because God showed you grace. And because of that grace, not that you can earn God's favor, but you want to show Him a token of your appreciation for the grace. You should change your life in the way that you act because you know that you're living under a constant state of grace which is what we're about to get into in chapter, end of chapter 2. So I have a few questions first. What motivates you to do what God expects? And that ties into what I just said. It should be motivated by your love for God. It shouldn't be motivated for selfish gain, for a pat on the back. It should be motivated by you love God and you recognize that He is a God that is worthy of your servant, your, your service, and, and your, the scripture says that we should be bond servants, we should be slaves to Christ because he purchased us through his blood, which that blood was only by grace that he purchased us. Second question, do you still have a soft heart towards the gospel? And I know for myself, I can't give an exact date or time when I was saved, but I've heard the gospel several thousand times, I'm absolutely sure. So it can get hard for us Christians that have heard it so many times over and over to still have, you know, any sort of guttural emotional impact if we just allow it to, yes, I've heard this a thousand times, I can recite it in my sleep, I know what the gospel is. But to not let it sink into your heart and have an emotional impact shows that you're starting to have a hard heart towards the gospel. And that's not only a negative effect to you, but that's a negative effect to your encourage, you feeling encouraged to share the gospel with others. If you're like, oh, I've heard this a thousand times, it's exciting, I know I'm supposed to be excited about it. But if you're not actually excited about the gospel, if you're not actually being emotionally affected by the gospel you're not going to want to share it with anyone else. So we're going to focus on a large portion of my notes, and what I want to talk about is verse 11. Mainly the the title there that came right from this verse, but just focus on the, the word, the grace of God. So I'll read verse 11 again. For the grace of God, you notice that it's four, so it's notice, notice that it, it is in context of everything that came before. So all these expectations of a Christian man and a Christian woman and a servant or a, somebody that's employed, those things are all expected because the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So because of the grace of God and you recognize your standing with God is only out of grace, only out of His love, you should be treating others this way. You should be acting this way. You should be actively working towards sanctification and having a relationship with Him and allowing that work to happen inside of you. So there are two kinds of grace I want to talk about. I'm going to put this away for now or else I'm going to get just distracted by that. There are two kinds of grace. I think a lot of us have heard these terms or these ideas, but there's this idea of common grace that applies to all human beings. Like I said in my prayer, we are all sinners. There's the unrighteous, no, not one. Even our righteousness, as we talked about at last men's breakfast, is like filthy rags. It's literally a filthy, disgusting rag that should be thrown away. That's as good as we can reach in our own righteousness. So common grace is talking about everybody receives this common grace if you're alive today. 
the fact that the sun shines on you, the fact that there's still oxygen on the planet, the fact that God still allows your heart to beat because we know that God is the one that fills man with life and he is the one that is the creator and sustainer. So that common grace is to all people. It doesn't matter who you are. God reigns, gives rain to the righteous and to the unrighteous. There's a second form of grace, which is called special grace. And I'm a little special myself, and I fall under this category. And anyone that has accepted Christ and had that relationship with him and been transformed have received special grace where God has specifically given grace to them by giving them salvation. Now, I will mention before I get too deep into this, this is going to sound pretty Calvinistic. So if this has... This whole idea of, of God choosing you and God being active and, and the one starting the process of, process of salvation has split churches, has ruined relationships, has caused countless arguments. But the truth is you can't get around it. It's in the Bible all over. Once you finally come to terms with God is ultimately the perfecter and finish of, finisher of our faith, he is the one that is the only one that can make a dead person alive, take out that heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. You see God's sovereignty and salvation all throughout the scriptures. And you probably didn't catch it, maybe you did, but we will see that here in chapter 2. If we're looking at it from a God's sovereignty and salvation, we will see that here at the end of chapter 2 as well. So when we we have that common grace everyone receives, everyone that's alive, and then we have special grace, which is those that God has chosen. As Paul has already talked about back in the first verse of this letter that he sent, to the faith of God's elect. Well, elect sounds like people that have been chosen. And not just chosen, but also in the acknowledgement of truth, which accords with godliness. So God chose people. He chose them for a reason, and that's us that have salvation. We have that special grace. So not just the normal grace of our heart beats, we get rain, we get sunshine. We also receive salvation because God has given that to us. There's also two forms or types that I want to talk about of God's grace as far as the way that God operates inside of how grace flows from him. So God almost passively has a grace that flows from him. It is a characteristic of God. It is a defining character trait of God as he is grace. He is filled with mercy and grace. And this is something that he pours out on us that are saved. He pours that out on the unrighteous, they get this passive grace that just flows from God. But there's also a more active force of God's grace that we see here, where it's not just a passive, we're living under God's grace, we have salvation, but it's also an active, God's grace is involved in our lives and transforming us and making us more sanctified and more like Him and encouraging us to be more godly. I have to use this term because it uh, somewhat matches with my last name, and there are some extra merits in the building too. But a lot of people use the term of grace as God's unmerited favor. So it is something unmerited means that you didn't earn any merit, you didn't earn any special tokens of, oh, I earned this for myself. It is something that is a free gift. God's free gift of favor and love towards you is what grace is. You did not earn it. You did not do anything to deserve it. Let's read some additional verses here. Let's go to Hebrews 4.16. Hebrews 4.16 says, I still hear some flipping. 
sorry. 416, for men indeed swear by the greater, and uh, I'm in the wrong spot. I'm in 616, that's not right. It's like youth group all over again. I always read the wrong verses. Here we go. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. This is getting to that idea of God having grace. It's an aspect of him. It is a personality trait, a, a core part of God is grace that flows from him. But notice there's also an active portion of grace that we're going to read in just a moment. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace. What does grace do? To help in time of need. So the grace is not just a passive thing that is flowing from God's throne. It is something that is actively working in our lives, sanctifying us and making us holy. I also want to point out, because as I just said, it's God's unmerited favor, we need to flip over to Romans 11.6. We need to understand this because so many churches teach this wrongly. Teach this heresy that you can earn your salvation, that you were a part of it, that you, you were sincere enough in your prayer, that you do, did these good things to earn God's favor and God's grace. But the scripture teaches us the complete opposite. Romans 11 verse 6. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer of grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. So what he's saying there, remember this is Paul, the same writer of Titus. What he's saying there is, if you did anything for your salvation to earn the grace of God, then it is no longer grace. I was just talking to my father about this. That if you were sincere enough in your prayer and you were so brokenhearted, God could say, oh, your work was good enough. You, you were so sincere about that. Here, now you get my grace. Or if, oh, I, I went to church and I did this and I did that. And God will be like, you're you did enough church. You served in the church. You're good enough. Here's salvation. But you can't call that salvation grace because grace is what? It's not a, it's unmerited favor. So it's nothing that you did to earn it. As Paul says right there, if it's of works, it's no longer of grace. If you did anything to earn your salvation, it is no longer grace. Now it is something that God owes you because you did something that deserved salvation, which we did not. And we know ultimately that Christ's death on the cross is the ultimate display of grace. It is a, a freeze frame of, of you want to see God's grace in action, you just look at the cross. You just look at this holy man that did nothing wrong. This holy man that could have said, my good works give me eternal life because he is God and he is perfect. My good works and the fact that I have never sinned means I never need to pay for, I never need to die. But instead he chose to die for us. He chose to die for us because of God's grace, because of his love for us. And not even because we were anything to be loved, but because God is so good that anything in us is not good. He sees that I love that person because they're a creation of mine. And I see my glory that I can put in them and I can display that. I can show that this worthless sinner has been saved by grace and did not deserve it and ultimately display that I am a gracious, loving God. It has nothing to do with that human being. It all has to do with me, which God as our creator absolutely deserves that. As a human being, we might think, oh, he's so prideful. He's so prideful and arrogant to think that 
He's the only one that deserves praise and glory. He's our creator. He deserves it. All right, I told you I was going to get emotional. All right, we got to cover um, the little bit there at uh, verse 11. <sighs> Bring salvation has appeared to all men. Just keep in mind, this is not Paul talking about universal salvation. We know that from verse 1 of chapter 1, that he's talking to God's elect. What he's most likely talking about here is that those that will hear Christ are hearing Christ. That it's appeared, Christ has come to humankind, and that it's being spread around the world. Paul is an example of that. He is spreading the gospel around the world. The gospel has appeared to all men. My dad, I believe somebody said this, but he, he quoted it, that why would, this was an Arminian, someone that does not believe in in the fact that God is sovereign totally over salvation. But this man said, in response to those that have, will never hear the gospel, those in Africa that we can say that tribe has never heard the gospel, but he said, why God is at, at no obligation to share the gospel with people that will not believe. That only those that will believe are the ones that have to hear the gospel. And the fact that any of us, we might think, oh, well, that's harsh because then these people are condemned to hell in their sins. Well, we all deserve to be condemned to hell in our sins. So the fact that he saved a single human being from their sins is more grace than we all deserve. Let's continue. Let's get into verse 12. Teaching us, notice this is God's grace that is active in our lives, teaching us things. And what is it teaching us? To deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. We need to deny ourselves. We need to recognize that the grace that we have received is nothing good of us that we didn't do anything to earn it, and now we have a, a mandate to now live under that grace and do our best, we will never achieve it, but do our best to live worthy of that grace, recognizing that the price that he paid was his own blood, and that any time that we are willingly living against Christ, we are living in ungodliness, we are living in worldliness, we're following the things that, of this world and we're enjoying our own sin, we are making a mockery of what Christ did on the cross. We are saying that your grace isn't good enough for me to live for. I'm going to do my own thing because it feels better to me to live for my own prideful self than to live for you who is so gracious and loving. So that's how God's grace has an impact in our lives, not only in a negative sense, but in a positive sense. We have a negative sense where we feel awful about ourselves and recognize how good he is, but also in a positive sense of recognizing how good and loving he is. And we can both weep over the gospel because we recognize how brokenhearted we are for our sin and our unworthiness and his love. And then we can also weep over the gospel because he is so good. He is so loving. And in contrast to our wickedness, he is so beautiful. There is nothing ugly inside of him. There is nothing sinful or, or, or wicked to look upon. There is only glory. There is only holiness, which is totally separate from us. So I ask you again... Does the gospel still have an emotional impact to you? And I think all of us have to say in some way or another that it doesn't have as much of an emotional impact as it should. An intellectual or a spiritual impact as it should. Because if it did, if we truly feared the Lord, we truly recognized that Christ died for our sins, and that there's nothing we can do to repay him other than give him our whole lives, why would we ever sin again? But we're selfish, we're wicked, we're sinful. 
So we forget about the grace of God. We forget about what Christ did. Instead of thinking, oh, I'm going to lie to my wife, and right before you lie, think, Christ died for that sin. I don't want to sin. I don't want to put any more pain on him. I'm not going to lie to my wife. Or I'm going to have an impure thought about a man or a woman. I'm going to think about, that person's attractive. I wish I could be with that person. Look how beautiful they are and have corrupt thoughts. Instead of thinking, Christ has shown me so much grace. How can I do that to my Savior? How can I dwell on that thought? So the truth is, the gospel is a roadblock for sin. It should be in our minds. We cannot do that because Christ has died for our sins. He's poured out so much grace. Why would we want to live a life of wickedness and debauchery? Let's continue. Let's get into verse 13. Just notice 2 and 12, there are not only negative things that it should steer us away from, but it's also positive things that should draw us into righteously and godly in the present age. And notice, too, that this is Crete, a place that is known for having very wicked people. That them, that those Christians that are in Crete are living in a wicked nation just like we are, and that we need to live in a godly way under God's grace, recognizing that when somebody says, oh, you're such a good person, or, or oh, you know, you must be a, a, a good Christian because you go to church, or makes a comment like that, we need to just turn it, turn it back to God that, no, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And I'm no better than you. We all deserve hell. But I have received Christ's special grace because he has saved me from my sins. Verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have a hope that no other people have. Anyone else maybe has fooled themselves in cults and false religions that they have a hope of some sort of afterlife, some sort of nirvana or whatever it is. But the truth is, only Christians have hope for the future. Non-Christians, all they have is destruction and God's wrath unless they get saved. So this glorious hope, this blessed hope, we should have inside of us. You know, we can be broken over our sins. We can be sad. And I, I listened to um, some Spurgeon sermons about grace. One of the greatest preachers, if not one, the greatest preacher in all of church history. And that man had major bouts of depression. Several pastors I know have dealt with depression. And not because God is not good. But it's because sin is so bad. A lot of times it's recognizing how bad you are or the sin that you're dealing with in your congregation is just oppressive. But the only way to get out of that is to look forward to the glorious hope to find joy in Christ because humanity has no joy, has no hope in and of itself. We talk about politics plenty and we talk about, oh, these politicians never do what's right. They should be doing this. They should be doing that. If they just did this, the country would, you know, get, get back to a, a better place. Taxes would be less. Inflation would be less. There are all these things that you listen to and you're like, that makes a lot of sense. Why don't we do that? Because they're wicked and ultimately because <laughs> I just have to remind myself I have no hope in any politicians. My hope is in Christ. My hope is in his glorious appearing. None of them will do what's right, just like anybody that's unsaved will never do what's right. Their righteousness will never be good enough. We have no hope in this world. We only have hope in Christ. And if you try to find hope in this world, you will find that you are terribly depressed. Donald Trump cannot save your soul. <laughs> let's, uh, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, 23. 
I hope you're uh, ready to be here all day. Rodney gave a mini sermon, so I only got so much time. All right, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And this is another thing, when you've been a Christian a long time, not only can you grow somewhat cold to the gospel, but you can kind of grow cold to this hope and this excitement for him coming again. Because you can say, I've been a Christian 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and Almost every, every sermon, every week, I'm hearing, Christ is coming again. The rapture's right around the corner next week. Probably he'll be here. Look how wicked the world is. Not that I'm date setting, but I'm just saying, we've heard this over and over again. The blessed hope is on his way. And we can grow kind of cold and callous to it of, yeah, he's coming. I'm going to live the same way this week that I did last week. Especially when Rodney preaches it, we're all like, yeah, whatever. (laughs) But I wanted to read that verse just for us to recognize that he doesn't break his promises. For he who promised is faithful. He promised he's coming back, he will come back. We don't know when. But we need to live like today is our last day. We need to live like he could come back this afternoon. Because, I don't know if you knew this, If you've ever gone to school, which I would hope all of us have gone to school, but some of you have probably gone to college, even myself, which I was a good student, still wait day before to write that paper, day before to do that, do that test, day before to do that project, you know, maybe two days if if they were lucky. But if we live with the mindset of he hasn't come for the past 2,000 years, we got plenty of time. I'm going to spend the next year living for myself. When he comes, it even says, will he find any that are faithful? When he comes, are we all going to be sitting back in our recliner? Uh, I went to church twice this week. I'm a good Christian. I haven't done anything for the Lord in the past three years. I haven't saved, you know, been active in the salvation, been active in the church, haven't shared the gospel, haven't really grown haven't been more sanctified, but probably be another three years before he comes, so I'm all set. But he's coming. Lo, I am coming quickly, he says. And God does not lie. We saw that back in Titus. The God who cannot lie. He not just will not lie, he cannot lie. We talked about his grace and how that's an attribute of God. We don't want to say, oh, well, God can't do something. God does not do things that are outside of his character. Those are things that he cannot do. He does not sin. He does not lie. He does not cause someone to sin. He never does wickedness. These are things that if you want to say, God God cannot do these things, it's anything under those categories because they're a part of his character. He will not go against his character, against his goodness, because then he wouldn't be holy. Then everything good about him would crumble. So we need to trust that Christ is coming back. And another thing I want to mention, a lot of people say Jesus isn't God, but check that out. God and Savior Jesus Christ. Take that. Jehovah's Witnesses and all you other cults that believe he's not God. He is God and Savior. He is God that came and died for us. Which I was just playing over and over in my mind. I was... It's always music that gets you emotional, you know. That's part of the reason why when we share the gospel, we try not to have people playing pretty music because it it can well up those emotions and excite you to have more of an emotional response than a true heart change. But I was just thinking as I was listening to a song that that God died for me, the, the creator of the universe, the one that is sustaining me, suffered so much. And I will say, and this is no judgment on any of you, but if after the Easter sermon that Rodney gave, 
and Rodney's demonstrating Christ getting on his knees, being tied to that post and whipped repeatedly, his flesh being torn, him being nailed to a cross does not well up any form of emotion. You have such a cold heart. I was almost crying in my seat because I was just thinking of the blood that is spilled by Christ and that so many people have grown grown callous to it because they're like, I've heard this sermon a thousand times. Why should I care? Because it is the only thing that can save you. And because it's God that is doing this. It is God that is dying for you. It is your sin that is being laid upon him. That should have an emotional impact. You shouldn't be thinking this is a casual thing. I hear this all the time. No, it's God that died for you. All right, here we go. People are getting hungry, so am I. We got to get those little crackers. Think about how God died for us. All right, verse 14. Who gave himself for us. Our God and Savior gave himself for us. You guys hear that? That he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. Zealous for good works. All right, look in there. I don't need a verbal answer, but I would ask this if this was youth group. Where in there does it say that we were active in any part of our salvation? Can you find it? Who gave himself for us, so that's a work of Jesus, that he might redeem, okay, I wasn't involved in that, but redeem us from our lawless deeds. Well, I had no, all I was giving, all I was active in that was those lawless deeds. The only place where I am found is where he saved me from how bad I was. It doesn't say, I prayed a prayer and I was so genuine and I was so repentant that he saved my soul. No, it says every lawless deed. And who did he do it for? Did he do it because we were so great? No, he did it for himself. And who are the special people? Who are the people that are saved? Who are the Christians that he has redeemed and elected? Who are they for? Him. And why were you saved? To be zealous for good works. To be on fire for the Lord. That's what zealous is talking about. It's talking about not being passive and not thinking, I don't need to serve in church. I don't need to share the gospel. I don't need to have any relationship with the Lord because I'm saved. I'm a Calvinist. God saved me and I believe that once saved, always saved. I can't lose my salvation. I'll just live however I want. Well, Paul tells you, shall we continue in sin that may, grace may abound? Well, we saw oh, the grace of the Lord. Shall we see it abound? Let's see how much grace God can pour out on me as a sinner. What does Paul say? What's Paul's response? God forbid or certainly not. I think mom has used this term or maybe dad has, but this term of don't be a grace abuser. Don't, don't. Look at all of God's grace and be like, well, I just need more of that. I'll just sin some and I'll feel better because I'll repent and God's graceful so he'll forgive me. Well, Paul says, certainly not. God forbid. Anathema, that's disgusting. Let's continue. Let's get into verse 15 and then I'll start wrapping it up. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Notice we've been talking about ourselves. We've been talking about Christ. But this is a letter to Titus. This is a letter to a young pastor. And he's supposed to exhort people, meaning telling them where they're going wrong. Well, encourage, exhort is encourage them where they're doing right and rebuke. So tell them where they're, where they're going wrong with all authority. So this is the message that he is supposed to bring to the people in Crete. This is the message, ultimately, that every godly pastor, everyone that follows God's word, should be bringing to their congregation. That you are a sinner. You are depraved. There is nothing good in you. Your righteousness is like filthy rags. But Jesus saved you, and it's only by his grace. 
Something I wanted to mention, too, is just this idea of who did Jesus go to? Did Jesus go to those that were righteous? Did Jesus go to those that were religious? Did Jesus go to those that followed his commandments for years? No, he went to the sinners. He went to those that knew that they were sinners. So if you think that you're righteous in any way, that you did anything for God's grace, that you prayed a sincere prayer enough, that you got baptized and I serve in the church, you're not the kind of person that Christ wants you to be. He wants you to be broken over your sin and joyful over his goodness, which is what the people that came to Christ and he went to, the prostitutes and the sinners and the tax collectors, That's why they had a heart change, because they knew how bad they were. This is something, when I was younger, that struck me is, here are these religious leaders that in, if a human was writing the narrative, the religious leaders are giving money to the Lord, praying multiple times a day, serving in the temple, doing all these things. If a human writer was writing the story of the Bible, they'd be like, That's who the Messiah is going to go to. Those are his buddies. Those are already serving him. Those are the people that are going to rally behind him and join his cause. Those are the people that murdered him. It was the wicked people that recognized how wicked they were that actually got saved. The self-righteous people were condemned to hell. Same as today. We have churches filled with people that are self-righteous, that think, I go to church, I served at VBS, I taught a Sunday school, I serve in the praise team, but have no spiritual life change through God's grace. And they're going to hell. They hear the gospel over and over and over again, and they still have hearts of stone. Keep this in mind. God is so sovereign over salvation, and I tell this to our youth all the time. Have you ever seen, and I ask Sawyer this a lot, God is the one that saves you because if you're dead in your sins, what are you going to do? What does a dead person do, Sawyer? They lay there dead. How many times have you or your family doing funeral business seen a dead person get up? Zero. Zero times. So if you're dead in your sins, can you muster up enough faith to get yourself saved? No, a dead person lays there dead. Who's the only person that has ever raised somebody from the dead? God. So if you're going to be alive in Christ, it has to come from God. He's the only one that gave you life in the first place. That's why it's called the second birth, alive again, born again, all these phrases. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. I'm telling you, we're wrapping up. (laughs) But we need to talk about this alive in Christ, because Paul, same writer of Titus, the book of Titus, gives it beautifully how we are so dead, we do not deserve God's grace. It is all a work of Christ. It is a grace being poured out on us. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to read quite a chunk. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. Starting in verse 1. And you, who made him alive? Who made you alive? He made alive. Who were dead in trespasses and sin. We were dead in our sin. All we were doing was paying into the sin piggy bank. We talked about this way back when we did VBS. That the wages of sin is just paying more death. Verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, talking about Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Keep that in mind. Do you have the power to overcome Satan? No. Who has the power to overcome Satan? Who defeated death? Jesus. So if you think, I have enough power to overcome the prince of the power of this air to muster up enough faith for Jesus to save me, 
then you're able to combat Satan. You're able to beat Satan at his own game. You're, I was holy enough to beat you, Satan. And just keep that in mind, too. If any human being could muster up enough faith and be holy enough, there would be no reason for God to die for our sins. God could be like, just be like that guy. That guy did it. That one dude did it, so I know it's possible. But no, not a single human being can. And newsflash, not a single being, human being can. And also, we're born under Adam's curse. We're all sons and daughters of Adam. So the sin that Adam committed in the garden has gone through all of time, 6,000 years plus. We're still sons and daughters of Adam. His sin still applies to us. So even if you could muster to be good enough, you're not going to, you're still guilty. And you're still going to hell. You still needed a Savior. Verse 3, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves. We all were buddies with Satan and the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. God does not love you unless you are saved. You are under his wrath. He hates sin. He will condemn the unbelievers to hell. Does that sound like a loving God? Yes, because he is just. But he is so loving because he shows grace to a few. But we are all, if you tell somebody Jesus loves you, you can only say it, Jesus loves you, here's the gospel. If you believe it, he will truly love you. He's giving you grace right now to breathe. He's giving you air. The blood's still pulsing through your veins. But he does not love you enough to save every wicked human being outside of Christ. Jesus won't save everyone. That's a, such a false doctrine. If God was going to save everyone, why would he decide such a brutal, brutal display of his hatred for sin? God hates sin. Verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Notice it's him that did it. By grace you have been saved. That special grace it's talking about right there. Not a passive one, but an active one, transforming a life. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Notice, he didn't just save you. He's giving you blessings in the future. He's giving you blessings now. He's not just good enough that he's like, boom, you're saved. You get to go to heaven, and it'll be really great up there. It's, you're saved, and I have amazing things planned for you in heaven, too. It doesn't just end here on this earth. It continues. Verse 7 that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is a gift of God. God's the one that unlocks the faith. There is a beautiful marriage, but so much heavier on the side of God's grace. God is the only one that can make a heart alive. There is a form of human responsibility tied into that, but if God has chosen you to be an elect, you will be saved. You will respond the way that God wants you to respond because he already chose you. Do you think you're powerful enough to trump God? That is some major arrogance. Let's go to verse 9. Not as works, lest you, anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Notice he prepared them beforehand. How did he prepare good works for us to do? If we chose God and we were the ones that saved ourselves and he didn't choose us. It's kind of hard to prepare good works for somebody that you don't know if they're ever going to be saved. All right, so final questions. How are you responding to God's grace? Are you spiritually dead? Are you someone here today that has heard the gospel now or every week, heard that you are a sinner, 
that the only way to have a right relationship with God is to put your faith in Him. And the faith that you have in Him, if it is actively happening right now, is a faith that He is giving you. And He is changing your heart. And now, if you are saved, you need to repent. You need to look at the sins in your life and turn away and want to live for Him. This is the grace that breaks your heart every time you sin, recognizing what He has done. This should change. The gospel should change the way we interact with our loved ones, with our wives, with our husbands, with our fellow church members. We should look at them and see, I don't want to fight with this person because they are a beautiful creation of God and they are filled with God's grace if they are saved. And if they are not saved, then we need to love them even more because we need to bring them to Christ. So are you spiritually dead right now? Please, please accept Christ. He is the only way. As Danella sang, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then for us that are saved, are you acting like it? Are you acting like God's grace is active in your life? Are you acting like God died for me? I need to change the way that I act. I need to change the way that I think. I was paid, my life was paid for with such a, a beautiful, precious, holy thing, Christ's blood, that how, do, how can I disgrace him? How can I betray him when he has purchased me with such a beautiful thing? Telling you the gospel is something that should break our hearts and bring us so much joy. It should have the most emotional impact on you, Christian. I have cried over Christ's goodness more than anything else in my life, uh, whether it's a song, whether it's a sermon, whether it's just a thought. This is something I had as a, a lesson a while back, just a thought that popped in my head. But the fact that God chose death and pain and suffering as his vehicle for salvation, even from the beginning, that Adam and Eve sinned and he slaughtered an animal and clothed them with it. That God chose in the human mind the most hard thing to go through, suffering, pain, and not just that, but the death of a child, the death of his son. He chose the most guttural reaction that we can have, the most broken heartedness we can have, the death of an only son. The, not just the death, but the suffering, the blood. Seeing him cry out, Father, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. To cry out, my God, my God, how have you, why have you forsaken me? For God to see that and say, this is how bad sin is. That this is what needed to be the payment. It broke my heart thinking about it. That, that God put this whole plan in place. He could have made it something slightly easier. Something slightly more casual. Something slightly less radical. But he chose the most radical, heart-wrenching thing of suffering. Pain of his only son to die for you. And then we hear the gospel and we just think, I've heard it a thousand times, it's fine. I can live however I want this week. I haven't served God in church in over a year. I haven't done this. I haven't shared with that lost loved one. But God paid that for you. God paid that for me the most radical, painful thing that a human being could adore. But then that's not where the story ends because he rose again, showing that he is a God worthy to praise because he is a God that can bring the dead back to life because he has defeated death. And that's what we're going to celebrate here. Be thinking about the fact that as we take this communion, that there was no other way, that God had orchestrated all of history to this focal point of his son suffering and dying on the cross. And there was no other way. He decided, I am going to make sure that every human being that will trust in me will not be able to say, 
God kind of skimped out at the end. He didn't go all the way. Every human being that is saved should be able to say, God loved us to the maximum, to the fullest, because he went 100%, 110% all the way by sending his son. He spared no wrath. He spared no pain. He spared no judgment. And not only a physical sense, but a spiritual sense being poured out on Christ. It's the only thing that can save you. If you are not responding to the gospel today, your heart is so hard. And it's only God that can change it. I'm going to pray real quick because I feel like we need to and then we'll go into the Lord's Supper. Heavenly Father, you are such a good God. You are such a loving God. I pray that this message would not just have an effect on those that are hearing, but also the one that is spoken. Lord, I pray that I would be more active, recognizing how good your grace is. That I would be more evangelistic, knowing that there are those that are condemned to hell. And as your servant Paul says, how will they be saved if they have not heard? If the word has not been preached to them, they will not be saved. And we know, Lord, that we don't need to feel guilty for not sharing the gospel because you will save who you will save, but we too want to be good servants. We should feel some form of guilt because (laughs) you died for us. And you expected it of us. This is a great commission to share the gospel. To share that everyone is a sinner under wrath. Lord, you are the one that we have sinned against. As David says in his psalm about the loss of his child. And the sin he committed with Bathsheba. He says, against you, Lord, and you only have I sinned. Because David recognized that you are the one that sets the rules. You are the one that gave us the Ten Commandments. And any time we sin, it might be against someone else. It might be an affront to someone else. But on the grand scale of things, it's weighed so much heavier because it is an affront to a holy God that has set those rules in place. That every sin we commit is ultimately against you. It's spitting in your face and saying, Christ's blood was not enough for me to show you love. Your grace was not enough, Lord, because I'm going to keep sinning and I'm going to keep doing what I want. Just as Paul said, teaching us to not follow after worldly lusts and lusts of the flesh. We need to take hold of that grace and let it transform our lifestyle. Lord, I thank you so much for these people that no one charged out angry as I gave this very, hopefully, poignant message. Um, It is tough things to handle the fact that we are not in control of our salvation, that you are the one that is in control, that you are the God that is sovereign over all things. Lord, I pray that we would take this communion And not be thinking about what's for lunch and and how long is this guy going to talk and how long is this going to be, but just be here in the moment. I, I pray that you would calm everyone's heart to be here in the moment and really grasp what you have done for them. That you are God, you are their creator, sustainer, and that all things were made by you and for you. Every human being was made for you. And that we are here to bring you glory. Pray these things in Jesus' holy name, our Lord and Savior. Amen.